this is the story of wolves in the rocky mountains of their secret lives intertwined with their prey the wapiti it is also the story of their decline and recovery in two of North America's most magnificent national parks, Yellowstone in the United States and Jasper in Canada. Yellowstone is the world's oldest national park. After its establishment in 1872, Wapiti were protected and multiplied. But the wolves were not wanted. By the 1940s, they were exterminated in and around the park. Today, Yellowstone's Wapiti number around 25,000. They have, in fact, reached the limit of their food supply. Each winter, several thousand starve to death. In 1995, an event happened that made news headlines nationally and internationally. The wolf returns to Yellowstone. 14 wolves, transplanted from Western Canada, were reintroduced into the park. Another 17 followed in 1996. The population increased after the birth of pups. The presence of this legendary predator to the world-famous park raises some intriguing questions. What effect will the wolves have on the Wapiti? Will the herds decline, recreating a better balance in Yellowstone's ecosystem? The future may tell. Some of the answers can be found in that other great wildlife sanctuary, Jasper National Park in Western Canada. The park is home to a variety of hoofed mammals. And large carnivores. Here, in this magnificent setting of mountains, virgin forests, pristine lakes and rivers, the interaction between wolves and their prey has been observed for more than 50 years. Jasper is 10,800 square kilometers in size, somewhat larger than Yellowstone. But its steep-sided valleys contain less suitable habitat for Wapiti, which favor open grasslands. Jasper's total number of Wapiti is about 1,000, but it is a healthy population. The Shawnee Indians called him Wapiti, meaning white rump. The popular name is elk, which is actually a misnomer. The first Europeans who arrived in North America confused the wapiti with the moose, which also occurs in Europe and is there called elk. The wapiti belongs to the same species as the red deer of Europe, but the wapiti is bigger. A mature bull stands close to one and a half meters at the shoulder, 
and can reach 500 kilos in weight. In eastern North America, European settlement soon drove the wapiti over the edge towards extinction. However, the species survived in the mountains of the American West, where protective measures became effective just in time. Jasper National Park was established in 1907. At that time, few, if any, wapiti had escaped the muskets of the fur traders and trappers. In the 1920s, wapiti were reintroduced. 89 animals were transported from Yellowstone. They multiplied to about 3,000 by the 1940s. However, at that time, predators were not wanted. To protect the hoofed mammals, park wardens shot any wolf they saw and destroyed dens and pups. On provincial lands surrounding the park, the placing of poison baits was a routine form of wolf control until the mid-1960s. Then finally, a new understanding and appreciation of predators arose among park managers as well as the general public. Today, the former varmint is one of the most popular wild animals of our time. The Rocky Mountain wolf is among the largest subspecies in the world. Males weigh 40 to 50 kilos, females slightly less. They are a third heavier than wolves in eastern North America, where nearly all are gray in color. In the west, about a third are black. In Jasper, the percentage of black wolves has gradually increased. By the mid-1990s, nine out of 10 were dark. Black wolves interbreed freely with gray ones, producing individual color variations. A gray female may have a litter of black pups. Dens are dug in sandy soil, in quiet places. No one knows how many dens there are in Jasper. The total number of wolves varies between 40 and 80. For more than 30 years, predator and prey populations have been allowed to find their own dynamic balance. In their prime of life, wapiti have little to fear from wolves. With antlers as well as hooves for defense, mature bulls are magnificent and appear invincible. During the rut, in late summer and fall, they bugle their challenge to each other.
the big bulls fight for the chance to breed, for the right to procreate. To enhance their appeal, they spray themselves with their own kind of perfume. There is no lack of contenders, and the dominant bull is kept busy, jealously guarding his harem. However, his success comes at a price. During two months of restless activity, he seldom has time to eat, squandering his body fat reserves. When the rut ends and winter begins, he enters the season of hardship in weakened condition, at the mercy of his waiting enemies. For wolves, the need to kill and eat is paramount. For Wapiti, the instinct of self-preservation to avoid being eaten is just as great. Fear of predators plays a vital role in the Wapiti's life. Fear is the common bond that draws the herd together. Predator and prey are locked in an evolutionary struggle, tested by time, that benefits both species, but sacrifices the weaker and unwary individuals. The bulls are put to the test. The strong ones soon quit running and stand off the attack. However, the hunt does not end until a kill is made. A wolf's kill benefits numerous scavengers. Neither the bald eagle nor the golden eagle is above feeding on carrion. Death is but a new beginning. The bull's remains return to the soil to nourish the flowers of spring. And the wapiti perpetuate their species through the calves that are born in late May or early June. Alert and suspicious, females employ several strategies to minimize the risk of predation on themselves and especially their young. Calves are defenseless and vulnerable. They are hunted persistently by wolves and bears. Before giving birth, Wapiti mothers retreat to places where predators seldom venture and where plant growth is lush. Some seek the solitude of high alpine terrain. Others in the river valley hide on islands 
separated from the shore by swift channels if necessary they take refuge in the river their long legs allow them to stand in deep and turbulent water where a wolf cannot find a foothold despite all precaution less than half of each year's calves survive the summer the wolf like all wild hunters lives by a simple code that blends necessity with opportunity take what is easiest to get easiest to kill Predation on calves is nature's way of preventing the herds from becoming too numerous, of keeping them within the bounds of their food supply, with enough left for other species. Wapiti compete with other grazers, such as sheep, for grass, deer and moose for browse, and with beaver for saplings. By eating young shoots, an overpopulation of wapiti can prevent the local regeneration of aspen poplar. Poplar bark is the main food for beavers, which in turn are an important summer prey for wolves. Destruction of berry bushes by wapiti reduces the food supply for birds, squirrels, and even bears. All are interconnected in the web of life. In Jasper Park today, all would be well according to nature's plan were it not that people are again disrupting the predator-prey balance. This time, not as hunters, but in their new role of protectors and admirers. Year after year, the park attracts more visitors who need more facilities that take up more valley bottom habitat, leaving less critical winter range for the animals. In the park, Wapiti do not shy away from people. On the contrary, their numbers are concentrated near the town, in campgrounds and along roadsides. They are attracted by the grassy clearings, and they have learned that near people, there are fewer natural enemies. The relative safety of their preferred environment is borne out by statistics. Near the town site and along major roads, the number of surviving calves is two to three times higher than in the backcountry. Visitors delight in seeing a wapiti up close, but there are risks. Females with small calves to protect chase humans away and sometimes kick them with their sharp hooves. Bulls can be aggressive during the rut. Each year, conflicts and injuries increase. Offending animals are captured and tagged by park wardens. Repeat offenders are removed. There are other problems. Where wapiti congregate, they overgraze and damage their range. In a less disturbed environment, the wolf would function as the wapiti's shepherd, forcing the herds to move from place to place. This fundamental principle of wolf and wapiti interaction, intended to benefit the ecosystem, now works against itself.
the presence of wolves in the back country forces Wapiti towards the road in the main valley where they cause another problem, traffic accidents. Apart from the hazard to travelers, several hundred hoofed animals are killed each year on the park's highway. Wolves as well. Numerous animals also die on the railroad that passes through the park. In hot pursuit of their prey, wolves have been known to collide with locomotives they could see coming from a distance. In future, the park's problems are bound to escalate as visitors and traffic increase and tourism development expands in the main valley. Suggested solutions to keep humans and animals apart, such as fences, are impractical and considered offensive by visitors. The dilemma remains. How do we save wildlife from people and leave nature alone? It is a paradox of our great national parks, Jasper and Yellowstone, that their wild treasure, their wolves and wapiti, need our protection, but they do not need us.